wish I were a more confident, extemporaneous preacher because that whole time I was just sitting there thinking about the sermon I could give entitled, We're All Chameleons in God's Grace. <laughs> but maybe I'll save that for another time. I'll give you the sermon that I, I did write, which is called Affinity Groups. And I'll tell you that one thing I really appreciated over the course of my ministry is how preaching, if it's done decently in one place over a period of time, really does become a conversation. It really does become a mutual endeavor. I get up here and share what I know and have experienced and believe to be true. And then hopefully, if we trust each other, what I share connects with you, something you know or have experienced. And if things are really great, then you sometimes tell me about those things, and then we have a conversation about them, and we both grow. A few weeks ago, for instance, I gave a presentation after coffee time about my research into American religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people with no religious affiliation, which is a rapidly growing dynamic among us. And in the wake of that, so many of you sent me your own thoughts and also other articles on that topic which were fascinating and broadened my understanding on this even more. I should have told you when I was at the beginning of my research and just let you go <laughs> forward, I would have had a much easier time. So thank you for that and for taking time to be in conversation with me. One article, and though I searched my email thoroughly, I couldn't find the reference uh, now, was about how many non-religious Americans are trying to fill the gaps in their lives that religion once filled. How does a modern, non-religious person, for instance, find long-term intergenerational community? How do they find a place for their kids to nurture relationships with caring adults outside their family? How do they find a place to serve common values and make meaning of life's ups and downs? How and where do they receive support in difficult times? Right, these are really important questions. Religion has loomed so large in our culture and in many of our lives for so long because it simply does so many different things for us. And how do those gaps get filled when fewer people are part of religious organizations? And the emerging answer seems to be that they are filled piecemeal, with different groups meeting different among these needs like the ones I've listed. This article that some of you sent me mentioned affinity groups as really scratching the itch for community that has a common purpose. So maybe you join a group of other folks who are really into Pokemon, or really love knitting, or are very committed to vegan cooking. And that forms a kind of community for you like the church might have done in the past, right? And that's okay. And it really got me thinking, you know, is there something that's lost if the church starts to see itself as just like one among many affinity groups? Like, hi, we're here, we're Rose City Park Presbyterian Church, and we're together because we're just sort of interested in this whole Jesus thing, and we meet on Sundays to kind of talk about that. How does that feel to you? Do you like, no, I got, <laughs> don't like that. Feels a little bit uncomfortable. Someone says, oh, I go to craft group on Thursdays, and you say, cool, I go to church on Sunday. I'll tell you, I felt a little bit strange when I started to sort of think this way and try it out as a thought experiment. Probably because we tend to frame religion as being something bigger and more important than interest. Right? We tend to think we're here because, at a very extreme level, we are the elect, the chosen people of God. Like, where else would we be? Or maybe more simply, we're here because it's the right thing to do. And actually, it really helped me to start thinking of this idea as a church as an affinity group because I think it releases us from some of those theological claims, like the idea that we're here because we're the saved ones, that we're here because this is the only way, which ultimately serve only to exclude others and blind us to our own liabilities. I started really getting into this, right? I was thinking, I actually don't mind thinking about the church as like a very welcoming sort of uber club to take care of all of your human affiliation and existential inquiry needs in one place, like the Fred Meyer of the human experience. <laughs> What's on your list today? <laughs> so I was into that for a few days when I was preparing, but then I realized that there are a few reasons that this frame doesn't quite fit for me, and I'm going to tell you about two of them. And first, I realize after a time, I, I truly do believe there is something deeper than interest 
going on when we get together here. I hope there is, at least. If we're here, hopefully it's because we're not only interested in this Jesus thing or this spirit thing, but because we're willing to let it make a claim on our lives in a more significant way than something like Pokemon or knitting could really do. If we're here, hopefully it's because we've made a choice to lean into the worldview that this tradition offers us, right? This belief that God has made us good and made this world good and remains present in both, intent on our thriving. If we're here, hopefully it's because we made the choice to really try to embody that and let it inform everything about our lives. How we use our money, how we treat other people, how we interact with a planet, how we fight for justice. If we're here, it's hopefully because we're committed to doing some striving once we leave here. Striving to be the kind of people who forgive, the kind of people who are generous, the kind of people who are interested to meet the needs of those around them and share, the kind of people who want to fight for what's right, and who are willing to put all the stuff of our lives on the line for this enterprise. I think in the world of human connection, there's a spectrum, right? From loose affiliation to fully intentional community. And hopefully, the church is at least always moving in the direction of intentionality and commitment. And maybe that's where the real difference lies, right? Not in how we approach the commitments of Christianity, but in f the fact that hopefully we end up changed by them in some kind of profound way in the end. And I actually think that's what both our scripture passages are about this morning, about what faith actually means in our lives and for our actions, you know? This Philippians reading particularly is one of my favorite ones by the Apostle Paul because it's one of the places where he's asking the big questions instead of just pontificating about things. You know, he's saying, so what? So what if we believe all this stuff? What difference does it actually make? Right? We heard from the message translation this morning, which I've loved. He says, if you've gotten anything out of following Christ, if God's love has made any difference in your life, if being a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care at all, then, then this whole litany of things basically be good to each other. I think that's very poetic, but actually I think the traditional NRSV also has some panache to it. If there is any comfort in Christ, if there is any consolation from love, if there is any partnership in the spirit, any tender affection, any sympathy, then make my joy complete and again be good to each other. In this passage, Paul is challenging his listeners to articulate how their lives have actually been transformed by implementing the morality that is pointed to by the cross. And maybe before we any, want to go any further, you should want to stop for a moment and check in with yourself about that. What has this life of faith meant for you? What has all this mattered? What difference has it made for you, in you? Or maybe you just want to have the words of Paul speak directly to you. Have you gotten anything at all out of following Jesus? Has Christ's love made any difference in your life? Has being in a community of the Spirit meant anything to you? Do you have a heart? Do you care? Then so what? Who are you because of it? And what are you doing about it? Now, to be clear, by asking that question, I'm not meaning to imply you don't have an answer. I know that you do. That's another thing I love about being in this long-term partnership. I know you, and I know how faithful you are. I am simply hoping that we might be able to work together to figure out how to start telling those stories to each other and to the community. Right? How to say, this has made a difference. I am different. Let me tell you how. And I say that because this is one of the primary critiques that non-religious folks, especially younger folks, have today of religion. You didn't do what you said. You were like the second brother in the story from Matthew who said, yeah, Dad, I'll do what you want, and then didn't. Often to those outside our doors, it appears that what we said as a church was love and justice and grace and provision. 
But then we, and this is using a general term to represent how the whole church has been perceived by those outside of it, then we excluded our LGBT siblings, allowed racial injustice to fester, hoarded resources that could have been redirected toward hungry mouths and lonely spirits. And all this is to say the time is really ripe to learn to talk about how we have been transformed by this affiliation or affinity group or whatever you want to call it, the church. Which reminds me of the other reason that I think affinity group doesn't quite fit for me to describe the church which I was thinking about. And it's because I think we don't have all that much affinity. (laughs) If affinity means anything like similarity. The church, it turns out, is a hugely broad, endlessly diverse, global community. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. I think sometimes we especially lose sight of it, ironically, on World Communion Sunday. Because it's our tendency to focus on all that we have in common with all the Christians around the world, which is a really important affirmation. But we think about how we're all saying these same words, and Jesus took bread and broke it. But sometimes we forget to think about how those words can be understood and internalized in so many different ways. And I've been thinking about it. I really do think the true enrichment of this day comes in focusing on how we are all so distinct and how the resources that make up Christianity, the beliefs and the practices and the values and the ideas, how they are deployed to so many different ends in so many different contexts. Right, for some, they serve a vision of long-awaited liberation, while for others, they serve as a deep connection to the ways of our ancestors. For some, this tradition is a great personal comfort, for others, a doorway into belonging or service. And of course, there are some places where Christianity is still deployed as a tool of subjugation. Some of them are right here in our midst, and we would do well to tend to that also when we ask what the fruits of our work are. But primarily, I think this day, this World Communion Day, is a recognition of all the various ways that transformation happens, and about starting a global conversation about the so what of our faith. Noticing that somebody heard the invitation of Jesus and decided to sit silently in a Quaker meeting, and someone else heard it and was compelled to swing incense in front of some Orthodox icons. And someone else heard Jesus' invitation and started to sing a cappella shape notes, and someone else heard it and started banging a drum. And someone else heard these ideas and got up and marched for justice. And someone else read Jesus' words and got the courage to come out of the closet. And someone else participated in the community, and it impelled them to hold on to the hand of someone who was dying. And someone else welcomed a foster child into their home because of the message that they heard in church. I think this is a day to celebrate that on a really big scale, to celebrate that there are 2.3 billion answers to the question, what has this done for you? And that we're part of that big conversation. I think, of course, it's also an invitation to consider how the so what is informing our own lives and how we are surrendering ourselves to one another on a really big scale to give and take in the way that Paul invites us, and to create a global community of mutuality that informs life in Christendom. You know, it occurs to me that for a long time, the project of Christian evangelism and cross-cultural outreach was about subjugation, was about getting everyone to practice Christianity in exactly the same way. But we are now in an era where culturally specific Christian expressions are being reclaimed everywhere, and in fact becoming the locus of Christian growth and progression. And there is so much work for us to do, as we are called to be subject to our siblings around the world, to be deep-spirited friends to Christians practicing in other places, not only making repair for wrongs done in the name of Western Christian cultural hegemony, but also reorienting our vision to the reality of what the church is now, which is a wonderfully vibrant, growing, multicultural, multiracial, mostly non-white, non-Western community. 
to bring this home with some data, if this is easier for you, Nigeria now has twice as many Protestants as Germany, the birthplace of the Protestant Reformation. And Brazil has twice as many Catholics as Italy does. A hundred years ago, 67% of Christians lived in Europe, now only 25% do, right? The church has changed and moved, and it is alive, and it is growing, and we are part of that. And we have a call within that to think about how to build this community of mutuality through the contributions of our gifts and through the receipt of wisdom and direction. And it's exciting to be part of that big thing. Maybe it assuages some of our own anxieties about the future of the faith. Maybe it calls us to explore some new wisdom about what it means to be good to each other here and elsewhere and what it truly means to respond to the morality of the cross in this time. The very least thing that it means is that we have access to this big conversation about what it can all mean and who we can be because of it. We can add our answers to the question of so what to this huge conversation that is unfolding all around us. We can think about what it means to come around this table and to see here representations of different answers to that question, knowing that they are all welcome and in fact are enhance our understanding of God's love. Those are the fruits of our work and the ones that we hope to do as we go forward from this place. So I offer that invitation to conversation to you in the name of the God who created, redeemed, and sustained us always. Amen.